Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, wherever you are in this world. My name is Alex Sigrist of Pangeo Techno Valley TV, and we're going to begin this 2022 September Pangeo Monthly Online Meetup. This is the Korea USA version, as we have our representative media company, tech media company, uh, Geekspin, who will be with us today. Thank you to everyone who is joining us. Uh, so we're in Pangeo Techno Valley, which is leading kind of the technology sector here in Korea when it comes to technology uh, with big companies as well as startups and everything in between. So that's why we're very excited to go ahead and meet some more companies today. Uh, we've already been able to have these meetups. This is our fifth meetup. Uh, we've had one with uh, Zhong Guang Sun in China, uh, Station F in France, Vietnam. Uh, so we get to talk to a lot of uh, people from around the world, and I'm especially excited today because we get to talk to, uh, well, a representative from my home country, the United States. Uh, so we'll be heading out to New York to do a little bit of that. Uh, we started off this by talking about a lot of the issues in tech, and uh, which was kind of a nice way to, I guess, get it going. But right now, we're sort of shifting towards more meeting up with companies uh, who either want to branch out into other markets or want to kind of get their companies known to other markets so they those companies coming to Korea uh, can uh, find out a little more information about them. And I think this is a great opportunity for that. I don't want to go into too much detail right now. We will do a brief presentation of Pangyo in a second. But for now, let's go ahead and meet some of the people who are here. Uh, why don't we start with Helena Stone, who is the uh, editor-in-chief at Geekspin. Uh, if you can say hello, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. It's uh, my first meetup, so I'm excited to be here. Great. Uh, are you currently in New York right now? Is that where uh, Geekspin is based? Yes, yes, I am in New York, um, and most of the team is based here in New York, but we are spread out all over. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, and we'll have a quick presentation from you in a second too. So I'm looking forward to learning a little bit more uh, about your uh, your company. Next up, um, we're going to go in order of the companies that we're going to meet today. Uh, we have Zenma, who is representing Breezum. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. Yes, yes. And uh, it's great. We have had the opportunity to meet before. And uh, I got to see one of your stores. So looking forward to kind of giving you this opportunity because it, it is such a, a interesting uh, concept. So we'll get into that in just a bit. Uh, next up, we're going to go to Jeff Cho, who I've also had the chance to meet and see his product too. And uh, looking forward to talking about your keyboard. Hello, everyone. My name is Jeff Cho, uh, CEO of uh, Mo Kibo. Uh, we are going to introduce uh, the fusion keyboard we invented for the first time in the in the world. Great, thank you so much. And uh, finally, we're going to go to Medi uh, Medi Medi I Plus, or is it Medi AI Plus? Medi I Plus. Medi I Plus. Yes. Uh, so Ji Hee Jung is going to be talking to us. Thank you for joining us as well. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to produce, uh, introduce our service. Our service is two products, the Vicro and Medici. We will introduce our, our product. Great. Well, thank you to everyone who is joining us. Uh, why don't we go ahead and get started? As we always do with this, uh, being the Pangyo monthly meetup, I'll do a quick presentation. I used to give longer ones, uh, but for people who are watching this video uh, on, on YouTube later on. Uh, if you've already seen the first couple of our meetups and you've already heard enough of me talk about it, but I will go ahead and get my presentation up on the screen here and do a quick run through of what Pangyo has to offer. All right. So Starting off very simply, uh, this is Pangyo Techno Valley, which is about 20 minutes south of Seoul, Korea by subway. Uh, that's how I got here today. It took about an hour to get here from the northern part of Seoul just to get here. But it's a very short, quick drive away from the city and really one of the more exciting 
tech hubs uh, that I've been a part of, not only because of all the companies here, but it's also a test bed for so many different things, uh, such as soon to be, what I always like to talk about is uh, the driverless buses that are going to be coming to this area to in, in the near future. But just to give some more background, um, this is Pangyo First Techno Valley. There are Pangyo uh, Second Techno Valley and Pangyo Third Techno Valley, but this is kind of the main hub area uh, that we're in right now. You can see here, this is sort of how, this is the vision of how this is gonna work based on these different areas uh, around Korea, including Pangyo, Techno Valleys two and three, which are relatively close by, uh, Techno Valley three being kind of in construction in progress right now. Uh, but then Yangju, Guri, Namyangju, Ilsan, and Gwangmyung, Shihung Research Complex, all of these combined are part of the growth project plans of this area. As we continue uh, into the future, this is just the background of what Pangir Valley really started as. Um, so it's been in the works for around 20 years now, the better part of two decades. And, uh, but a lot of this really has developed in the last couple of years. And uh, when it comes to the, uh, the infrastructure, of it, I would say the last seven or eight years is when it really started coming together. It was a project that uh, a lot of people, at least that I've talked to in the industry, uh, in the startup community, wasn't sure that it was gonna take off. And kind of it's, it's exciting to see these changes because now when I talk to those same people, uh, it's really gone beyond our expectations as far as not just the infrastructure, but the networking opportunities and, and really the movement of some of these big companies in Korea to the Pangyo area. Uh, we'll go through some of those companies' names that you might recognize as we're going through this. This is just some basic information about the area. Uh, if you want more information, I suppose you can pause this video in the future. Um, but like I said, you know, it was about 10 years in the makings uh, from 2005 to 2015 for Pangyo Techno Valley 1. But really, it is kind of... Um, it's expanded even since then. And I would say, yeah, it was around 2015 that this really started taking off. Kind of just the basics of the area and, and sort of their promotional slide, if you will, when it comes to this, um, the idea of bringing together startups, knowledge, education, and environment. There are really a lot of different um, parts of the infrastructure here when it comes to like test beds, when it comes to education centers, when it comes to the companies themselves, as well as in the building we're in right now is uh, one of the two major uh, startup accelerator hubs that they have here. So there is a lot that goes on here and everything, you know, this isn't just, uh, how, do you, how would you say this? Uh, this isn't just the government saying, this is what we do. It's actually putting actions to their words uh, and so this really is an incredible community that they have out here. Um, so I know that um, Elena is going to plan on maybe coming to Korea at some point. I wasn't sure of the exact details, but if you do have the opportunity to come out here and anyone else who is watching from outside of Korea uh, and you're interested in this industry, this is certainly the place to check out. Just some information on um, more statistics of Pangyo, Techno Valley. Uh, I think we, yeah, we still have the slides, but this is just kind of a, a view of the growth of the industry in itself. Uh, it did take a hit when it came to the coronavirus as a lot of the career really shut down, especially compared to other countries and even compared to the United States, Korea certainly uh, struggled a lot as networking was a huge part of this startup community out here. Uh, but nonetheless, still in 2020 and 2021, the growth didn't stop. The funding didn't stop. Uh, and people were coming from all over the world in the startup community. So we were able to uh, really expand out here. Here are some of the companies. Again, you might recognize some of them. Africa TV, Kakao, Samsung. Um, you have LIG Next One, the different SK companies representative uh, Neo is NC, Krafton, some of the companies you might recognize. 
uh, in the gaming industry, in the uh, social media industry, in the electronics industry, all of them uh, are out here. And so this is kind of what's been helpful is the inner industry co cooperation between uh, intra industry cooperation between some of these large companies, some of the startups that are out here. Uh, an example of the support facilities that are in this area, including the startup campus, uh, which is right around where we are right now. Um, so we're going to go ahead and just keep going. Again, if you need more information, you can screen capture this if you're watching the video at home. Um, but that's about it for this. Um, these are some of the achievements they have. But again, like I said, a lot of what's the most impressive to me about this is kind of the, it is being able to experience sort of all these technologies, uh, whether it's actually being able to go to the, uh, you know, one of the stores of Breezum, which we're going to be talking about in a little bit and see their technology at work for their eye care uh, industry uh, to go to some of these personless convenience stores, uh, restaurants, cafes that you, you know, order and it's just robot. It's just kind of test beds for these companies that want to see how they can push the limits of uh, the AI future. So it's really a cool place to be. If you have the opportunity, again, highly recommend that you come out here. And that's going to be it for this presentation. If you have any questions, of course, um, feel free to ask them. Uh, but for the most part, that's the basic overview here of Pongo Techno Valley. Let me go ahead and stop screen share right now and get back to everyone who's here. Welcome back. All right, uh, so that's it for me. Uh, if you have any questions, again, feel free at any time to ask. I know that, of course, the companies represented here do work here, and uh, many of the people even in uh, our media organization live in this area as well. Um, so they know even more than I do about the area. Um, but that's about it. And without further ado, now that I've gotten to talk about myself in this area here, I'd like to go ahead and open the floor uh, to Helena Stone, and we can start talking a little bit about her company, because I only know about them through their YouTube channel, which I was able to check out a little bit beforehand, uh, as well as uh, their their website, because I guess I've been so engrossed in the in the world of tech in Korea that uh, I, I I got to find out a lot more because of um, uh, because of our work here now, I get to find out a little bit more um, about the company, but I don't know enough about them. I know you're from New York. I know you have a background in, you have a master's degree from New York University. Uh, this isn't your first company in the tech field when it comes to media. So without further ado, can you go ahead and introduce yourself to us and uh, tell us about yourself? Sure. Um, well, you did some good sleuthing um, with, with those little tidbits. Um, I am a New Yorker. I'm a sixth generation New Yorker. Um, and I have been in the tech world on the media side for over 15 years. Um, and that's allowed me to see the rise and fall of all sorts of companies and technologies. It's It's been a very interesting ride, especially being on the media side. You know, we get to see so much as it's being planned, as it's being developed, and as it crashes. <laughs> um, there's so many highs and lows that I've gotten to see, and I'm, I'm very grateful for it. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, so is that uh, visible? Yeah, okay, that should be okay. Um, so yeah, so Geekspin is, is my second publication. Um, and you know, Geekspin is not a typical uh, tech media publication in, in that it caters to a very lifestyle audience. So um, we cover technology, we cover consumer electronics, um, but we very much cater it to the average person. Um, so that, and, and we also cater to passionate people that are geeks. Um, and when I say geeks, I really mean like a, wi a wide genre genre of geeks. Um, so just some stats to understand who our audience is. Our audience is mostly American, primarily US, um, skews towards millennial age. Um, so lots of people in their 30s and 20s and, and low 40s. Um, and these are 
people that are passionate about everything from Android to iPhone to video games um, to comics uh, to science fiction. Um, and we curate content that we know they'll be passionate about and that we're passionate about. Um, so I'm not going to go too much into myself. I mean, I mentioned um, myself um, a little bit more, and Alex mentioned, gave a little bit of background on me. Um, I've been in, in media and online publishing for like, uh, like I said, about over 15 years. It's my second publication. Um, but I am going to jump next into what we're all here to talk about, which is startups. And um, specifically, I'm going to talk about the New York startup environment. Um, the U.S. is a very, very large place. Um, and I would say that New York has really developed its own distinct startup culture, um, which is quite different than Silicon Valley these days. Now, the world thinks of when they think startup, I do think they associate startups with, uh, with Silicon Valley first. Um, and that is where it kind of all began. But nowadays, New York is, is really, really hopping when it comes to startups and new companies. Um, so yeah, so Silicon Valley is, is no longer the hot place to start to launch a startup anymore. It's New York. Um, so And that's really evolved over the past five years. Um, every day you hear about a new startup, a new company, a new someone that's testing something here. Um, despite the pandemic, 2021 was actually a very, very big year for, vent, for, venture, to cap, for venture capital in New York. Um, and New York has now become the second to biggest um, tech hub in the United States. Um, so I, I have some stats to, to, to uh, reinforce that is that the New York based venture capitalist firms raised an estimated $1.6 billion in funds in 2021. And the venture backed startups in the region raised more than 55 billion. And th this is what, what is what we know of. Okay. And this is just like for basically new growth companies. Um, some notable New York startups are Kickstarter, uh, Vice and Tumblr. These are all huge companies from a very different spectrum of, of product and services. And they all started here in New York. So, why are startups attracted to New York? Um, I mentioned the VC, the venture capitalists scene, um, and that continues to be a huge reason why, why companies and, and uh, people are coming here. And that's because there's just a lot of VCs that are based here. Um, this is where they're coming to pitch. This is where they're coming to network. Another thing that's attracting startups to New York is that there's a huge huge pool of talent and high quality talent, um, especially when it comes to engineers, marketing, um, there's a lot for them to go after here. Um, along those lines, we have a huge population. We're over eight and a half million people. And we're not just eight and a half million people, but we're eight and a half million people that are very diverse um, from all different cultures, from all, from all different walks of life. Um, and that really allows companies to have a good testing bed. You know, they have something of everyone right at right on their doorstep. Another thing that has been attracting startups to New York is that um, the city and the state have been coming up with different um, tax benefits to attract these new companies. Um, I'm not going to go into all of them, but um, I actually don't know all of them. I've, I've, I'm, a, I'm familiar with a few, but. One in particular, which I thought was interesting, was that there's a program subsidized by the government, which by the New York government, which um, it offers new and expanding businesses the opportunity to operate tax free for 10 years um, if they're operating near a university or college campus in New York. Right. So and, and that makes sense because they want they want to bring companies that are going to hire people out of school. Um, another thing that's happening in New York is blockchain growth. Blockchain is getting really, really big here. Um, New York's becoming a hub for blockchain technology. Um, there are over 250 blockchain startups in New York operating right now. And our mayor, Eric Adams, has stated that he wants New York to be the center of cryptocurrency. Uh, side note, he actually got his first three paychecks as mayor 
he got paid in, in blockchain. Uh, maybe not the best idea, but <laughs> in retrospect. But um, so what challenges are New York startups facing? Um, as much as there's a lot of great things that come with being in New York and that are drawing companies to New York, there's, you know, there's, there's some downsides as well um, to being in New York. Um, one is that the competition for talent is, is very intense. Um, there's lots of good engineers, but there's lots of companies fighting for those engineers and salaries are high and it's competitive to get good talent. Um, so it's, it's, it's a great position to be if you're um, an employee, if you're a professional with skills, um, but companies got to fight for you and they got to earn you. Um, another thing that's not great about New York and it's only getting worse, um, especially um, in the past uh, past year is real estate. Real estate's very expensive. Um, so that makes it more expensive for companies to have headquarters. Um, there is somewhat of a balance to that, which is that the pandemic has made allowed companies to downsize their headquarters. Most people are working remote. Um, so, mo so most companies are actually downsizing their headquarters and their spaces. Um, but if you need to do, if you want to like have a factory or if you have something that's more, more um, hands-on based, it's going to be expensive to, to operate in New York as a result. Um, another thing is that just general competition, um, you know, we've got tons of people here. Um, so you're competing with other companies, um, other people, other companies. Um, and Another thing is that's a challenge to New York start startups is, is the hustle here. Um, everybody knows when you think of New York, you think of the hustle. And, and that really is both a gift and a curse. Um, you know, there's so many, like, for example, there's so many venture capitalists out here, but they're being swamped with ideas and with pitches. And you got to fight to get their attention. You got to be really good. Your idea has to be really good. Your pitch has to be really good. Um, so you're 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 fighting to uh, to get a piece of that pie, and it's not always easy. Um, and and then you know the last thing is a saturation. Um, the New York City market, the technology market, has um, not sorry, not just the technology market, but pretty much every industry in New York is <laughs> oversaturated. Um, and uh, I'll, I I have a really good example of that, um, which was. Right before the pandemic, um, some companies started to open up, which were all about delivering groceries to your home within 15 minutes. Um, within halfway through the pandemic, there was several of them. Um, and then I'd say about a year and a half in, several of them just closed shop. Not all of them can make it. Some got acquired, some merged, and some just folded. Um, and I mean, New York's a great place to test a concept like that, and some did succeed, but a lot failed. Um, so that that is it for me um, as far as the state of New York and what's happening right now um, in the New York startup scene. Um, yeah, I know, Alex, I will let you take over. Great, thank you so much. Um, I actually was writing down some questions that I want to bring up. Um, and I will bring up, however, due to time constraints, uh, we're going to have to switch the order of you and I talking quickly about the startup cultures in New York and in Seoul and in Pangyo. Um, we're going to go ahead and let um, Zenma Park from Prism take the floor because he does have to leave a little early. So we're going to just switch the order to the company uh, presentations and interviews first. We'll come back to a discussion of, of New York and Pangyo towards the end, and then we'll wrap it up after that. Is that okay with everyone? Great, thank you so much. All right, uh, so uh, without further ado, I got to actually go visit one of these um, branches out here in Pangyo to get my eyes checked and do uh, something really interesting with, you know, not just 3D printing, which was the buzzword, you know, before, but now using AI technology with 3D printing um, and kind of, Doing something that in America isn't as easy to do without a doctor's prescription. Um, but you know, that's my intro. And because of time, I think I'm gonna see what how he's gonna explain it first and then do this do a presentation and then quickly we'll uh, go ahead and 
uh, talk to Helena and do something more. So first, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Alex, for a uh, detailed introduction. And it's very nice to meet you, Helena. Uh, actually, we have a business development manager in New York City. So it's great to know that you're from New York, sixth generation. That's great. <laughs> okay, let me start with my, uh, my presentation. Okay, uh, I'm Zemma Park, co-CEO and co-founder of Prism. And Prism is a personal eyewear brand disrupting the old and conservative eyewear industry and upgrading it to the next level. Actually, there are so many different uh, types and shapes, sizes of faces, but glasses have been manufactured under one size fits all philosophy so far. As a result, 72% of eyeglasses wearers in Korea are experiencing pains from ill-fitting glasses. Also, purchasing a pair of glasses has never been a pleasant experience. Even in this 21st century in Korea, you still have to bargain to buy a pair of glasses in Korea. So many people are complaining about this outdated consumer experience. And we believe that with the help of IT technologies, we can change and improve all of these problems up to next level. Prism has totally redesigned and redeveloped the way we buy a pair of glasses and the way how glasses are manufactured. So I will show you how we've changed the status quo of the glasses using the IT technology from now. If you visit our offline store, we first take a 3D scan of your face. Then we conduct an analysis on your facial measurement with 18 different factors. Compare this data with our 21,000 previous visiting consumers' facial measurements and their purchase data. And we come up with the style recommendations. You can try on these styles easily with our virtual fitting system, or you can actually also try on uh, the samples ready at the stores. You can also choose all the details like material and colors of temples, types of nose pads, etc. And now it's time for us to get busy. So our opticians work with our digital fitting system to redesign key details of eyewear for the perfect fit. We adjust the bridge size to fit your preferred distance, customize nose pads, and readjust the angles and lengths of the temple reflecting different location of ears. Because everybody has different positions for their ears and they complain from the pains with their temples often. So this personalized design data will be transferred to two of our factories. One is our 3D printing polymer frame factory, and another is a laser cutting titanium frame factory. Our manufacturing process is so simple and efficient. We use industry, industrial uh, level powder based 3D printer that can produce up to 200 different frames at a time. After 12 hours of 3D printing, we go through a sanding process for smoother surface and dyeing process for a variety of colors. Now a pair of prism glasses are ready for you. Also prism is the world's most environmentally friendly eyewear because conventional eyeglasses are first manufactured and distributed to stores. So more than 50% of conventional eyeglasses are thrown away during distribution process. But we, at Prism, we manufacture per order, so we leave no extra inventory at all. Also, more than 90% of material is discarded in the process of a conventional acetate frame manufacturing process. But we only use the, the just amount of material for production. As a result, we can reduce the carbon footprint from glasses up to 95% versus conventional eyewear. 
And these are the pictures of the world's first titanium personal eyewear that we recently launched after three years of research and development. Our consumers are very much excited with this new product. And this led to 60% of a sudden increase of our monthly sales since last June. We have been growing exponentially for the last four years, started, started with 40 guests for the first month, and now we are serving 1,400 guests each month. And now we are operating six stores in a near Seoul, one including in, uh, in Pangyo area, and we will soon expand to 10 stores within this year. But our next target, the most important target is the US market. As you know, America is the country with best diversity of races, which means diversity of faces. But glasses in American market are made to fit majority Caucasian consumers. So minority people have a hard time finding right fit glasses at the, at the glasses store and we respect the diversity of America with our advanced technology. We just finished developing our mobile application. So consumers in the US can download our app from App Store and enjoy the fun and easy eyewear shopping online, which is designed exactly the same as the Korean consumers are enjoying at the shop. Every steps you can <clears throat> ah, sorry. <clears throat> so you can first have a, your uh, face scan and we collect your facial measurement data and provide the style recommendation, virtual fitting. And you can also order your lenses for your optometrist prescription. And a pair of personal glasses made just for you will be delivered within three weeks. So after listening to all of our journey, you may wonder how young and small startup like Brisbane can make everything I mentioned in-house only for the last four years, the short time. Our co-founders group is consists of specialists who have deep understanding on each process of our supply chain. And we are consist of uh, eyewear craftsmen with 25 years of experience in this field and 3D printing data specialists and full stack CTO. And I have um, myself have uh, 16 years of uh, eyewear distribution experience. And also I'm a marketer. And also we have a branding expert as a co-founding member. So we have everybody who can cover all of our steps. So as a team, we have done our best to innovate the industry from the scratch, from the consumer's point of view. We are not selling glasses. We are your lifetime vision and look care partner. And we want to make the world brighter for everybody. Thank you so much. So this is it for my uh, presentation. And uh, if you have any, any question or any comment, I'd be more than welcome. No, thank you so much, Zenmo. That was great. Um, really appreciate you kind of explaining it way better than I could, uh, but it's interesting to think about the differences in the US market and the Korean market and see how this might uh, play out once you really expand there. Uh, and because of that, I think well, we might have an interesting conversation between you and Helena right now. So um, if, if you have anything you wanna say to Helena or vice versa, uh, the floor is for the both of you. And if not, I will jump in with some questions myself. Okay. Um I do have a question. I, I don't know if you mentioned this or not, but how do the prescriptions work? Uh, for American consumers, you have to visit optometrist office to get the prescription, right? And you can either take a picture of the prescription or also you can input the data on the prescription and we will recommend you with a uh, suitable lenses. 
And then we, uh, we etch the lenses here in Korea and we'll send them to you in the United States. And, and usually and in lenses in Korea are much cheaper than those in, in America, so yeah. Um, and, and, and in Korea, you can use the app to get a prescription? How does it work in Korea? Actually, in Korea, it's illegal to sell prescription lenses online. So Korean consumers have to visit offline store. Okay. But American uh, consumers can order online. So we just collect the prescription from consumers directly. And we yeah, etch the lens to fit the frame and send them to you in the States. Um, one last question for you, and then I'll let Alex take over. Um, what do you think is going to be your biggest challenge when entering the U.S. market? Actually, we are we are having a, a Kickstarter campaign at this moment to test the market, and uh, we have some hard time explaining ourselves because um, we are like this concept of personal eyewear is new to the market, and most of the consumers are not actually recognizing what their problems are with their glasses because there has never been any other option. So it takes quite, a, quite an effort and uh, amount of knowledge to deliver what we are actually doing to consumers with a, uh, for example, with a short like advertising campaign. So we need a lot of, I think we need a lot of PR activities to uh, educate the consumers that they have a better option and uh, to touch their amenities. So yeah, I think it, it takes a little bit of time and effort for, yeah, for us. And your help will be great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it will be appreciated, Helena. Okay, well, great. Uh, Alex, go ahead. Oh, it's, it is interesting. In Korea, when you go to a lens store, you have to, but they have it on site usually. You can get the prescription checked out, right? Once you go to the glasses store, you can get checked out. Right, right. The difference between the U.S. and Korea is that in U.S. you have to visit separate optometrist office to get lens prescription. But here in Korea, opticians, you can just visit the optician and you have your, uh, you can have your eyes examined and prescription there as well. We don't have an optometrist system in Korea. So that's the difference. It'd be interesting to see if you could market it to tourists to travelers from the United States, just because, you know, when you visit another country, if you go and buy those countries products, you can save money and it's like saving money on your plane ticket almost. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know it's really expensive in the States to visit a doctor if you don't have insurance and then get prescriptions. So that'd be interesting to see as well. Um, yeah, uh, we're nearing 11 o'clock. Uh, I guess I, because I know you and, and I got to visit the company, I already asked you a lot of questions already, um, but I, I think it would, I I'm curious to see how you will market it to Americans because to me, you struck a chord when you said, you know, I don't know what I'm looking for. And with glasses and actually with fashion, I have no idea about fashion. I just know when something is wrong, but I don't know what looks good. Um, but before, I never really knew how to, judge what good glasses look like on me. So I, I was wondering, are, do you have a particular plan when it comes to marketing? Is it through social media? Is it through um, news outlets, organizations? What would be your plan to reach that American audience? Okay, um, actually uh, the best luck we had was that uh, the iPhone has adapted the true depth camera for face ID. And with that functionality, we can 3D scan the consumer's face using their iPhone. So the steps are very easy and uh, we can collect a lot of data. So we are thinking about developing a like sort of entertainment app that consumers can play with. So they can have their facial scanned and we can either recommend some styles or some mask for fun, like a, for example, for a Halloween mask, something like that, or also something like a face, face reading. 
So this type of fun uh, activities, I think we can uh, invite consumers to download our app. And that's one, one, one of our uh, strategy to apply in the future. But I think the most important uh, message we can, we can spread out is that the importance of uh, well-fitting glasses, because especially in, uh, in America, I have met a lot of consumers, at, especially at the CES 2022, complaining about uh, their noses. So Caucasians have too high nose, so their uh, glasses are sitting way too high. And the lenses are made to fit the distance from your eyeball within like 12 millimeter. But most of Caucasian uh, people with a high nose have uh, more than 20 millimeter. And with that problem, they cannot actually uh, fully utilize the function, function of the lenses because what they are seeing is actually smaller than they are, uh, their optimist metrics that has uh, given the prescription. So this type of uh, problems can be fixed with our technology. So in Korea, we are making alliance with, uh, with uh, ophthalmo ophthalmology doctors to spread out this message that wearing good fitting glasses is good for your clear vision. Okay. I had no idea, but that makes a lot of sense about the nose. <laughs> thank, uh, thank you so much. Um, I know you're a busy person. You, you do have to go, but I really appreciate you taking part in this monthly meetup. All right. Thank you very much. I, I'm so sorry to leave you early. Yeah. <laughs> oh, please. Yeah. Good luck with you. everything. Yep. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, so that was uh, checking out personalized eyewear. Next up, we're going to be going back to the computer screen in front of us, and uh, a key component of that would be the keyboard. And so we're going to talk to Jeff about Mokibo, which is a keyboard that I got to recently check out and uh, see how it worked. But uh, perhaps it's best maybe to let him do the explanation this time. So why don't you go ahead and uh, tell us about yourself, tell us about the keyboard. That'd be great. <clears throat> OK, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, the Fusion keyboard that uh, we invented. Let me share my screen first. OK, can everybody can see uh, the screen of mine in full screen? OK, uh, Fusion keyboard is the keyboard we, we invented for the first time in the world. Uh, very simplify, uh, explain the concept of, of uh, our keyboard. The keyboard itself, the key cap itself is the touchpad, so you can uh, control mouse on top of the keycap, that's it. So you don't need to bring a mouse or touchpad separately, or there's no need for the a separate space for the touchpad. So if you see the right uh, video, uh, just if you type it, it just works as a perfect um, type um, keyboard. If you swipe your finger uh, on it and it just start to move uh, mouse point or it also support uh, gestures. So the reason we make this one is that um, uh, if you make a fusion keyboard, uh, the traditional uh, touchpad and keyboard uh, has a lot of space, but we can uh, reduce the space 40%. Uh, even though the space is smaller, but the touchpad size is, is even bigger two or three times. And then because of uh, the touchpad, um, uh, touchpad part is disappeared, so the weight is much lighter. And then we can apply uh, this technology to uh, the specially uh, tablet PC typing cover because uh, it has not enough space for the both keyboard and touchpad. So uh, for example, Apple's Magic Keyboard, they just lift up uh, the uh, iPad and then they made a small space uh, for the touchpad. But if you use a uh, fusion keyboard, you don't you don't need to uh, bring up the iPad, and then uh, you can put the uh, keyboard very large size, and even though you can use a uh, two or, two or three times larger touchpad on it, and then uh, in the future there is a, a flexible display uh, laptop computer is coming, uh, and then there is a lot of, a lot of um, prototypes, but there is. A, if you see that there's one uh, single big problem, there is no um, mouse pointing devices at there. 
Uh, so if you put uh, the fusion keyboard on it, the problem is solved. Uh, also in the uh, VR device like Oculus, uh, they support a few uh, Logitech keyboards on it, like a K830 model. If you put that keyboard in, in front of uh, Oculus 2, um, they put the image on of a keyboard into the uh, VR image uh, screen. And then, uh, but at the same time, they have two different part, keyboard part and touchpad part. Even though you have uh, wearing the uh, VR devices, you have to move your uh, arm from keyboard to the touchpad and you have to back your arm to the keyboard. But the problem is that you are wearing uh, the VR devices. It's very hard to find out uh, the keyboard and touchpad and then again back to the keyboard. It's very hard because your eyes is blocked. But if you, if you use a uh, Fusion keyboard for the uh, uh, VR uh, devices, um, input devices, you don't need to uh, move your hand. You just put your uh, hand in one one uh, place and then you can type and the mouse and type and mouse very easily and quickly. So it's very uh, convenient for, especially for uh, the VR device as well. And then for the auto driving car system, um, a lot of people will uh, enjoy entertainment and even uh, some people will uh, work inside of car um, like a small uh, personal office. But the problem is that uh, the space of uh, inside of a car is very limited. There's not enough space for the keyboard and mouse or keyboard or touchpad. And then if, um, but if you use a touch, uh, Fusion keyboard on it, if you have one screen and then if you have a very solid Fusion keyboard, it's enough for the input uh, mouse and keyboard. Uh, who wants? Because uh, because of this kind of uh, features, you have a lot of uh, interest from uh, big companies like Apple and HP, Logitech, uh, Lenovo, and then also in Sam Samsung in Korea. Uh, they have uh, looked at uh, our Fusion keyboard and we delivered uh, some uh, technology samples for them to review. And then some of them, uh, they, as I know, they are uh, starting making some sample uh, of their product with our Fusion keyboard. I'm hoping that uh, in a near future, two or three years later, they will uh, out, put out their own uh, model with a uh, Fusion keyboard. And this is uh, uh, our first generation Fusion keyboard in 2019. It, it looks like um, very, uh, in the picture. And then the, uh, at that time, there is a two button underneath, have a left click and right click. And also that button, uh, is a, a mood change button. If you put your finger on the a button, then it works as mouse. If you release your thumb, and then it just works as typing uh, keyboard. And then this is the second generation. We uh, uh, go on the market this year. We already done a Kickstarter last year, and then this year we launched this product. We have three model, universal model, and then iPad Pro 11 inch model, iPad Pro 11, uh, 12 12.9 inch models. At the moment, we released a uh, universal model, which is uh, it, it works with uh, most of uh, um, OSs and laptop or uh, tablet PC and even uh, mobile phone as well. <clears throat> if, if you see the uh, picture on the uh, left downside, the touchpad size is three times bigger uh, than Apple's Magic Keyboard. And then Apple's Magic Keyboard doesn't have a function line on top, but you have function line even uh, not on top. So uh, it's ultra uh, portable, it's very light and thin, and then uh, no need for the trackpad. And then it uh, pairs up to three different devices. And then it ha has a cover and the cover uh, become a uh, protect the keyboard itself. And also it became a uh, mobile device stand like this. So uh, very handy to carry and then use a mobile device very easily. Now, why keyboard? Because uh, we have uh, invented this uh, keyboard uh, about 10 years ago and then filed a patent. And then I got paid because I, my background is a uh, patent engineer in LG electronics for 10 years. So we uh, prepared a very strong uh, patent portfolio in over the world. And then we have uh, around over 60 uh, filed patent and then over 40 uh, patent has granted already. And then uh, uh, separate from uh, 
first generation, the second uh, generation of uh, Mukibo has an auto mood recognition uh, algorithm. So uh, if you just type it, the uh, Fusion keyboard recognizes, oh, it's typing. And if you start to move your finger, uh, the Fusion keyboard just automatically recognizes, oh, the user is starting moving your finger for the mouse point, and then automatically change the mood. So if you're typing it, the uh, the mouse point is never moved. And then uh, when you uh, move your uh, mouse point with the right hand, you your uh, left hand are uh, usually uh, resting on top of the keyboard. So we blocked the left side of a uh, uh, touchpad so that you can rest your right uh, left hand. But if you uh, start point from right side to the left side, the touch area automatically uh, expanded to full size uh, area. So it sizes over uh, three times bigger than normal traditional touchpad. And the very, uh, the UC is very simple. So if you open the cover, it's just a turn on the keyboard and then the cover become um, smart device stained. And if you close the cover, it automatically off the switch. This one is uh, the comparison uh, table for the first generation and second generation. It's much uh, lighter and then accurate and an automotive change. So it's much better than uh, before. Uh, this one is, uh, I just uh, compared the uh, uh, Apple's uh, patent because uh, before I start my uh, company, I just uh, monitoring uh, Apple's uh, patent and I'm sure uh, they are uh, making Fusion keyboard like um, product in near future. And then during the 10 years, I just found out uh, they are uh, branching out. Uh, we call it continuation application. A lot of continu continuation application of a Fusion keyboard like patent. And I'm sure uh, they are going to um, uh, make Fusion keyboard like um, keyboard on their product. And then I'm ready for um, the patent portfolio. And a uh, few more uh, patents for the Mokibo and then Apple. Uh, they are focusing on some user experience UI side. And then uh, they are focusing on more um, very expensive and then uh, typing feeling, a better typing feeling uh, mechanism like that. And then, um, but uh, Mokibo has a more like a um, Fundam fundamental technology size uh, uh, patent portfolio. And then finally we got it. And then uh, Apple's uh, fundamental patent has uh, rejected recently because of my, my keyboard. That's my uh, patent um, portfolio. Um, so this is the end of my presentation. And thank you for listening. If you have any question, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, like I said, I got to experience it. It looked really cool. It was very functional. It was very pleasant to use. Uh, I may have a question or two for you at the end of this, uh, but before that, why don't we let Helena take over and uh, you guys can have a conversation. Okay. Um, well, that was, you know, a very um, interesting keyboard. Um, it, you know, it kind of felt like you guys came up with something that is so obvious yet why is no one doing it um i personally am curious um how it would actually be to experience it um in in practicality um on average jeff how long does it take for someone to get used to operating that at like their regular speed that they would be using a mouse and a keyboard okay in my experience and then we do a lot of a survey and then we find out um uh, the people get used to, uh, if you are over a 40s or 50s, it takes 10 minutes. If you are over 30s, it takes two minutes. <laughs> if, if you are teenagers, they just do it. Wow. No need to learn it. Even though, even though I start explaining, they just found out all the functions of it. Interesting. Okay, so it sounds like it's very intuitive. Mm. Um, all right, well, my, my next question for, for, for you would be, 
what would be your dream product to see this on? Now, obviously this product is made for, like you said, tablets, flexible screens, VR, but like what, the, what gets you really excited? Okay. Uh, this is my first uh, try uh, of uh, my product. Uh, and the, uh, the reason that I started this one is that because um, I don't need to move my arm, but also I need to, um, uh, how to say, I need to get rid of um, plastic of mouse because I was strongly believed mouse is um, uh, not typically needed if you have a fusion keyboard. So in the world, a lot of plastic for the mouse is, um, um, you know, discarded and then, um, the, one of my uh, vision is that to reduce the plastic mouse in the world. And then uh, the other um, a pawn factor, the, the product I want to make is that uh, like um, a small, small notebook size um, laptop, you know, for especially for the woman, the uh, small handbag, I would like to put um, this size of laptop put in there in, inside of their um, um, handbag so that they put anywhere use uh, the laptop keyboard uh, so that at the moment we have uh, making a portable keyboard and then a typing cover for the uh, tablet pieces uh, but uh, the lastly I want to make is that a small size very slim uh, laptop computer that's my uh, goal of the fusion keyboard that, that that first one about um, reducing mice, that is a very ambitious um, and very ambitious goal. But um, I think that's great because potentially we could reduce waste. Um, so I'm, I'm all for it. Um, one last question. Um, you mentioned Apple and that Apple is likely doing something like this. But you said that you are ready. Can you elaborate when you meet what, what you meant when you said you are ready for them? Okay, uh, because as a, a patent engineer, um, uh, I'm ready means um, uh, in the patent area. If they uh, make a fusion keyboard like a product, we are ready uh, to propose our uh, patent. Uh, so that they recognize they are infringing my my technology, and then another one is uh, ready means uh, if they make a uh, fusion keyboard like keyboard, and then they have also they are uh, patent, and then we have product more keyboard have product, and if they uh, make a, a, a claim patent claim or patent lawsuit, um, I am ready to um, respond all of the patent is not infringing our keyboard because uh, for 10 years, I uh, monitoring monitored the keyboard uh, and their uh, patent. And then I just, um, I'm sure uh, the Fusion keyboard is not infringing all of their patent. That means uh, for the engineering, patent engineering, they said ready means the kind of in, uh, meaning. Okay, so you, you're worried, you don't want them to say that you're infringing. No. <laughs> okay. Okay. So it's not that. Okay. It's not the opposite. Okay. That, that I got you now. Okay, cool. Um, well, it's a very, um, it's, it's, this product has a, has potential to go a long way. I'd say, mm -hmm. um, Alex, um, I'll let you take over for a bit. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I, I don't know what you're talking about. I would love that tiny, small laptop. I think that I would use that. I'm trying to reduce the weight that I carry around every day um, when I'm just trying to write a Word document at a at a cafe. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really neat. My question is, what kind of person likes your product? And I mean to say, in I'm sold. It's, I'm sure it's the same in New York, but in Seoul, you have a bunch of. Um, you have freelance writers, uh, you have writers for TV shows, you have um, people studying for tests that go to cafes a lot. Right. Um, and so there's obviously someone like that. Mm. Also, it could be someone, since the name is in there, it could be, for lack of a better word, geeks or nerds, you know, 
people who are kind of like to be at the forefront of tech almost mm -hmm. um, it, besides demographics, besides age and gender or whatever, is there a type of person who would really like this product or is there a type of person that you're targeting? Mm. Okay. Um, for, uh, for our data, it's a 40, uh, 30 and 40, especially men, they are um, uh, the main users of a uh, Fusion keyboard. And then um, what I found uh, their uh, job is a um, key, uh, software programmer is the top and the second was a counter. Mm. The second and third was that um, a business businessman who uh, work outside a lot, like a cafe or during their movement, they have to uh, modify their report, something like that. They like that. They like this very small and handy um, keyboard because a uh, uh, Fusion keyboard can um, modify um, PowerPoint or Excel with their uh, mobile phone as well. If you have a mobile phone, you can just modify Excel or PowerPoint with Fusion keyboard. So uh, even though they don't have a laptop computer, if they have a Fusion keyboard, for instance, or in case in their uh, bag, they are feel feel very free. Feel they very free. They are ready to uh, respond their boss's recommend. So uh, the third ranking is um, the people who work outside a lot. That makes sense. That uh, I have problems editing. Excel files on my phone a lot uh, because even just simple copy paste functions, trying to do that on your phone gets yep. <laughs> absolutely fresh. I didn't think about that. Uh, like a, just a general business person that needs non word related, you know, Microsoft office or PowerPoint, whatever it might be. That's cool. Uh, I, again, like I said, I've gotten to see it. We had an interview earlier and I saw you moving your script from across the room with it. I thought that was kind of a fun, fun way to do it. And um, yeah, uh, and like I mentioned earlier, I mean, not to just promote everyone's products here because they are good companies and good products, but it is a really cool gift idea as well. And it's something that um, right. uh, I think has a lot of potential in both US and Korean markets. So I hope everything goes well with you. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, one more thing that uh, last week we uh, met for the interview and then I just um, uh, prepared for the sample you and your team to use. Also, Helen, if you need, uh, if you uh, leave uh, your uh, address, I will, I, I will be happy to uh, send us, uh, send our, uh, the product for you to review or uh, take test. Sounds great. Looking forward to it. If you need one more, uh, more than one uh, product, you can just let me know the, uh, the uh, how many pieces you need. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Oh, I, I did have one more question. Um, wait, is it being sold in the U.S. now via Amazon or whatever? If you visit my uh, uh, homepage, you can you can buy it right now. Okay, you can buy it and get it shipped to the U.S. Sure. Is that priced in Korean won or U.S. dollars? Because that's a, that's a discount so now for U.S. citizens. One twenty nine, one twenty nine U.S. dollars. Okay, cool, good. All right. Well, thank you so much again uh, for the presentation and answering our questions. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, let's pull your screen off, uh, your screen share off for just a second. Okay, and next up we have uh, Medi I Plus. Uh, we have Jihee Jung, who's going to be introducing her company and then answering some of our questions. So uh, you have plenty of time, but uh, this, the floor is yours. Please go ahead and uh, give us the introduction. Hi, I'm Jihee Jung from Media Plus. We are offering our data curation service for the best and easy clinical trial preparation. During COVID pandemic, vaccine was very important, but clinical trial preparation took too long. Not only COVID, but also with many other newly found diseases, companies couldn't find information of clinical trials since they are too scattered to find. So we find out that the previous clinical trial prepa 
preparation market has some problem dealing with the information and partner search. First, it was too difficult to gather information about clinical trial partner CRO. CRO means contact research organization. To search them, client had to call them or find their website to directly contact for the contract. This method is too much inconvenient and wasting time due to the absence of information platform. Second one, the cost estimation is too limited that client had to make unnecessary contract with consultant. Even the cost of consultant varies, most of them are high price. Finally, as a client prepared to conduct clinical trials, they have to check each CRO's audit and past experience of clinical trials by themselves, or they need to make another contract for the prepared or clinical trial, which is a waste of time and money. To solve this bottleneck of existing system, we developed the FICO, a matching service connect clinical trial preparing company with the CROs. FICO offers such by sub divide condition like business area, history, location, work scope, or disease. Then, as a client set up the range of requests, we recommend the best CRO that fit to the requirement. By using FICRO, client can reduce up to 80% of clinical trial preparation time and cost. It just took about 10 days to find the right CROs as within the existing system. It took about three months. With the cost, we could reduce about 10,000 to 70,000 US dollar for the preparation. This result is proven by our close barrel service. With a domestic service, we've seen drama, dram, dramatic reduction in preparation time. As we offer the information of a CRO, one of the bio venture client reduced time from three months to five days, and the other reduced from six months to 10 days. With the overseas service, we offer the information for successful clinical trial in Korea. We match CROs that can fulfill the requirement of the client, and we could also check out the outstanding result. Oh, can I, uh, can I stop you right there very quickly? Yeah. Uh, do you have more slides that you can go through? The slides aren't changing. I don't know if you have any more. Oh, uh, really? Uh, wait a minute. Which page? Uh, it was only the first page that was showing. Oh, uh, really? Mm, I'm sorry, if there is a technical issue, is it possible? There it is. We see it. I see it now. Uh, yes. This is the first page or? Uh, it's moving now. Um, not first page yet. Actually, I don't know what the first page is. I think you just continue where you were and just, we weren't seeing the slides, but I think you could continue where yeah. you were. Yeah, maybe during uh, the questioning period, when uh, Helena has questions, you can kind of go through the slides and we can see them as you two are talking. But yeah, go, like you said, um, go from where you left off and I think you'll be fine. Yeah, yeah. I would like to probably direct this result is proven by our cross battle service. With the domestic service, we've seen dramatic reduction in preparation time as we offer the information of a CRO, one of bio venture client reduced from three months to five days, and the other reduced from six months to 10 days. With the overseas service, we offer the information for a successful clinical trial in Korea. We matched the CROs that can fulfill the requirement of the client, and we could so check out the outstanding result. Our business model with Pycro is somehow an interaction between CRO and client, like a bio venture CROs 
provide us their information and estimation of what they can do. Then PyCross save, save them in the database later when BioVenture or our other client requests clinical trial estimation, we look for the information CROs have provided and match the best one. We deliver the contract request to the CRO and when they agree with it, the contract is done. With this fast and easy matching system, it only takes about 10,000 to 30,000 US dollars for the preparation. That is very cheap compared with the consultant. The other problem within existing system is that it is too difficult to gather clinical trial result data. Within this situation, companies are having problem in the preparation of clinical trial. First, as they don't have much information, they lack relevant infrastructure which leads to unnecessary new contract with other companies. Also, the scattered information is too hard to collect and analyze it since companies have to find data by web searching or direct phone call. To solve this problem, we are developed Medici, a global clinical trial information service. We offer search by subdivided conditions. Our global data secure from 20, 221 countries globally help clients to find the specific information they want. They can look for the specific material, clinical trial result, guideline, or regulation, or companion data. After we the step of data cleaning and classification and some analysis, we provide the result client wanted to find. The database we have included domestic clinical trial information without any data cleaning of problem, which means that clients don't need to extra visualization with the result. With the AI technology, we recommend the best information that fulfill the request of the client. The result will be satisfying since we offer them with effective management and visualization. So what is different compared to the existing service? I brought a chart compared our medicine with other competitors such as Citrine, CCI, CT, and WCG. We have the large global clinical trial information database. We gathered over 500,000 global information of clinical trial results. And as you see, you have various data range, which others don't. With our medicine, we analyze them by ourselves and present to the client. Efficiently with the boxes highlighted in blue, they are the only category that are only provided by medicine, our service. Since we have a massive amount of data, it is possible to present various service to the customer. Our planning to enter 46 trillion global clinical trial data market with category expansion. The insight partners predict this market to grow 10.5% annually. We are looking forward to joining this three part of market. We will expand the maximization of the profit and we will secure our client as well. As the market grow, our profit is also expected to go up. Now with 15 MOUs, we are making about $30,000, but by successfully operation by Crow and Medici, it is expected to go up $200,000 in first quarter and about $400,000 in 2023. This graph shows the specific growth of profit. With the current status, it will go up to $118 million in 2026 and business profit over 40 because of our database service. The growth rate will be rising steeply as we find more clients and develop our service to fulfill the demands of them. We have 21 brilliant employees who are doing their, their best and we are planning to recruit more experts for better product development. Currently, we have partnered with over 50 clinical and non-clinical trial centers and university institutions, and we are still looking for more network, and we would like to expand for to USA. Media Plus will be allocated in clinical trial system as a data curation to solve the problem in the existing system. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you for uh, sharing that with us. Really appreciate it. Uh, if you don't mind, while you're answering questions, um, just go over, if you can take us to the first couple of slides um, so we can see it, that would be great. Um, but I don't think it's necessary because you spoke clearly, so we did hear what you were talking about. Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So um, great. Helena, do you want to take it away? Yeah. Um, you know, so just, you know, hearing um, everything about what you guys are doing, um, you know, what I gather from this is that it's not just that you can potentially save companies money, but that you could potentially save lives uh, because you're really expediting the timeline um, for these clinical trials. Um, and that I think is very, very powerful on top of the fact that you're saving costs. Um, I am curious, what, what, do you, what kind of clinical trials have you worked with so far? Uh, first, we focus on cardiovascular disease because I was working in Bayer, so I'm re responsible about cardiovascular disease area. So we start on cardiovascular disease, and we will expand this oncology area some on our open open disease. Okay. Um, and I, I think you said that so far you've been doing this in Korea, in South Korea, correct? Uh, some different situation because I don't. Okay, wait, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Domestic close beta service result is from Korea, but they want to conduct clinical trial in Australia. They want some outbound some market. So overseas services, so European uh, UK medical device company want to conduct a clinical trial in Korea. So our focus on exchange market inbound. So many overseas pharmaceutical company or some biotech want to conduct clinical trial in Korea. This is inbound market. So many Korean uh, opposite side, many Korean biotech biotech or medical device company want to conduct clinical USA or some Australia. That is outbound market. Um, and but I ultimately is your goal to to expand to the U.S. Yes. Yes. It is. Okay. So, uh, you know, from everything I understand about the U.S. medical system, it is a complete mess and a complete disaster. Yeah. Um, so how do you plan on tackling that? Because it, it, it's it, even within the hospital systems and medical systems, everything is so fragmented. There's so much going on, healthcare providers, um, different systems. How are you like, what do you for how do you foresee getting into the US and into those systems? Uh, I really understand about that. Two years ago, I would like to study some USC in LA for regular regulatory pair system. So I fully understand how uh, how different some in Korea between some USA, but in clinical trial, in terms of clinical trials are very clear because uh before the regulation system, clinical trial is a, a great area about the healthcare system. So many biotech want to conduct clinical trial, contact with some CRO. CRO has a lot of the documents and some uh, overcome the data, scattered data. Okay. So it is, uh, choice of CRO is very important for clinical trial. So we developed some five group, find the CRO, it is the time and cost and very uh, market fit CRO. We can find market fit CRO. Um, that's it, that's it for me, um, Alex. Uh, yeah, I, I studied biology and university. And so that means I know people who are in the field now and it's interesting you brought it up. It is a mess over there. Um, I like the idea you brought up saving lives um, by reducing the time. Potentially even reducing the cost could save lives by bringing these products to maybe poorer nations as well. Um, I, I, I wish I, I wish I was more knowledgeable in this area um, when it comes to the actual clinical sides of things. This is a, just a question for me related to the industry, because again, I, I know less about this. 
Um, is the reason that European companies want to do clinical trials in Korea and Korean companies want to do clinical trials in Australia? Um, is, is it um, Come on. when it comes to different races or ethnicities? Yeah, 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 yeah. Are, is that why it is to like to test the different um, effects of a drug on different groups of people? Uh, because as already know, um, medical device or some medicine is a very one product for globally. So if you approve from FDA or some EMEA for new drug or some new device, uh, you some proven their racial difference issue. Okay. So many Korean people, many Korea biotech want to conduct clinical trial for Caucasian people of Australia or some European mm, or some yeah. So USA Biotech was a medical de device uh, company wanted Asian people from Asian nation some data. So mm. they want to conduct clinical tri trial in Korea. So and one more information. Do you know which city is a very number one global clinical trial city? Pangyo, I, I have no idea. Pangyo is a wish, but in, <laughs> until now, some Seoul. Really? Yes. I did not know that. It's number one. This is so NIH provided this information because the five big five hospitals in Seoul, and second one is in Korea, some global healthcare system. So, uh, collect the participants very easily. Third one is that is. Uh, custom in Korea, so bali bali, so quickly quickly manner. Uh, yeah. So that is this entire clinical trial period. So Seoul is the number one, but I wish Pangyo is the number one. <laughs> That's uh, so funny though. Um, I remember when I was in grad school in Seoul, I. I was in grad school, so I didn't have any money. So I almost did a clinical trial because they were specifically trying to find uh, Caucasian people yes. to do the test in Seoul. And yes. uh, I, I think my partner at the time, she would have killed me, so I didn't do it. But that was a, yeah, I never even thought of that. But yeah, I guess that's why I've seen, I've gotten a few of those offers before, but I've never actually done that. Yeah, but um, I think about Punk is a very, uh, nominate the number one city because many people live in Sepangu and many biotech uh, exist in Pangu, so it is a very attractive city. Of course. Um, well, uh, I think that's most of what I have for you for questions. Um, thank you for sharing with us. Is, is there anything else you'd like to say before we end this? Any final words? Uh, yeah, uh, Helena, <laughs> if you have some company which want to conduct clinical trial in Asia, please sub into this our company and I will go to New York in February next year and I hope to see you in New York. Oh, absolutely. Definitely reach out to me and I uh, would love to to see you here in New York. And uh, I will definitely keep an eye out for, you never know what I run into on this side of uh, the ocean. So I will definitely keep that in mind. Oh, thank you. Uh, great, that wraps up our company portion of this. Uh, we're gonna go back now and quickly just, I have a few questions uh, about the New York startup scene. Uh, we are, little short on time, maybe about 15 minutes. But again, if you have any questions about the Pangyo scene as well, um, please uh, let us know. If you don't mind, Helena, can, uh, can I start? Sure, go ahead. I was really interested when you said you mentioned the rise and fall of industries and corporations. And um, uh, you weren't in the industry at the time, but I had stocks in the, uh, what was it, the 2001 tech bubble. And then there was the housing crisis, um, the, the bank crisis. And now we're looking at the next potential big recession coming up. First, I wanna ask you that we're seeing signs of a recession on the micro, on the macro level. We see all the data coming in, 
are you seeing signs of a recession in the tech field over there, whether it's related to businesses shutting down or lower venture capital funds? Um, well, you know, tech is interesting because the dot-com bubble, which you mentioned, that, um, you know, com companies were decimated during that period. Um, but that was the early 2000s. And if you look back at that time period, the reason, at least in my opinion, why those companies fell apart was because they didn't really have a real product. <laughs> um, most of them were selling air um, and ideas that they just couldn't actually produce. Um, but then if you look at the last recession, which was 2012, um, tech actually survived pretty well. Um, and it, it wasn't really hit that badly. Um, and that's because by the time the recession hit in 2012 and those that that time frame, they were actually producing products and services that were real and that were useful. Um, I think that the technology sector had learned from their mistakes from a decade before. So I don't think that um, we're going to see that sort of um, impact, that sort of negative impact on the technology world the way that we did 20 years ago. Um, and yes, there are layoffs happening. I am hearing rumors from different, um, not rumors, I'm, I'm hearing rumblings, different companies having layoffs, different companies in trouble. But I don't see it as a collapse. I see it as a the best surviving. Um, and I see this as something that was going to happen anyway, but the recession is really expediting that process, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, do you, you mentioned blockchain technology earlier, and that's a big part of the industry in Korea or a new emerging industry in Korea as well. Then do you see that being, obviously it's not as big as the internet bubble was back then, but when you mentioned that com some companies don't have products in that industry, whether it's these coins that are kind of, or ICOs, or do you see sort of uh, I don't want to call it a collapse, but like, do you see any parallels between the internet bubble where there was excitement and then collapse, and now it's back to high levels with, you know, internet, Amazon or Google, whatever. Do you see that in the crypto, I don't want to call it crypto field, the blockchain technology field? Uh, absolutely. Um, and, you know, so many people are comparing what's happened in the crypto market um, to that original dot-com bubble. And I do think that there is there are a lot of similarities because there um, there have there have been a lot of blockchain companies that um, have imploded, um, and a lot of it is because they weren't they didn't really have a solid product or service or foundation. But the other side of this is that there's just a lack of regulation and accountability in this industry right now, and um, that's also led to the collapse of these companies falling apart. And I think it was also similar, like similar to 20 years ago in the dot com world. You know, nobody really knew what they were doing quite yet. Um, and so blockchain is having growing pains, having similar growing pains. Um, you know, everybody talks about also everybody talks about crypto and blockchain. And I think that there's just common misconception. Everybody thinks that it's currency, that it's just money, but it's not. Blockchain is a lot more than just a currency. Bitcoin itself is a currency. Um, but everything that's come after that is, is not just a currency, it doubles as a technology. And I don't think most people understand that. But essentially, when you're buying a cryptocurrency, with the exception of Bitcoin, you are buying a technology. You are investing in a company's technology. You're placing bets on that service and that technology. And just like when you buy into, uh, you invest into a company or, or a stock, there's a good chance it's going to implode and th that a lot of these companies aren't going to succeed, especially when you're an early investor. And that's essentially what's happening now in the crypto world. It's unregulated. It's still very young and not every, not every company is going to survive. Um, but it's exciting, right? I mean, um, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's really, we're still in the wild west of crypto. Um, but at the end of the day, I see blockchain as the evolution of the internet. Um, so it's not going anywhere, um, but it still has a lot of maturing to do 
before it stabilizes. Okay. Um, thank you. I, and my last question is more about, it's kind of a, I don't want to call it a fun question. That's not the right word, but uh, Geekspin, the name Geekspin. And uh, based on what your target market is and even the personalities of the people who work for your company. Um, okay. I'm, I, I shouldn't even like pretend to be serious. When I was growing up, geeks and nerds were not cool. Um, what do you think brought about that change where being nerdy or being a bit of a geek, uh, what about the American culture that changed in the last 20 years that allowed it to be more acceptable? Well, um, it's, I think it, a lot of that has to do with the fact that geeks are running the world right now. <laughs> um, um, I think everybody in the, I think it's, I hope it's okay for me to say, but probably everybody here is a little bit of a geek. Um, if you're working in technology, you're probably, you know, you're, you're, you're passionate about techie, you're a geek. Um, and I mean, we've got everyone from Bill Gates to Mark Zuckerberg. Those, those are geeks. Okay. And they are industry titans and leader practice, almost world leaders. Um, so I think that has really changed the perception of what a geek is. Um, and nowadays it is absolutely cool to be a geek. It's cool to be different because the people that are the geeks are the ones that are innovating and changing the world. Okay, uh, thank you. That's all I have for you. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to know before we wrap up? Uh, no, that was it. It was so great to, uh, to speak to everyone and to hear about these new technologies. Um, I will just add that this is, you know, the South Korean startup market is, industry is is very new to me and I have been blown away by all the innovation coming out of it from you guys. Yeah, um, absolutely for me too, because uh, don't I am media. So don't look at me as someone who's creating this innovation. I just get to see it firsthand and report on it. So uh, that is my enjoyment in itself. Um, okay, uh, so I guess we're gonna go ahead and wrap this up. I do wanna quickly say thank you to the organizations, companies that came by including uh, MIDI, I+, Mokibo, and Prism. Uh, I know some of them had to leave uh, to get back to working. It is the middle of the day here, almost lunchtime. Uh, and of course, uh, I'd like to say thank you to Helena, who uh, is now, oh, what, what time is it in New York right now? Is it? It's, uh, it's bedtime. It's 11. It's bedtime. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah it is, it's about time. Um, I was just in New York uh, a few months ago, and I'm happy to see the city coming back to life uh, in, in more ways than one. So I want to also wish, uh, I don't want to say wish you luck. I will continue doing your good work out there and uh, bringing information about the startup scene, the tech scene out there. And uh, I continue to look forward to maybe catching up on some of those YouTube videos, but also reading your, uh, going to your website as well. And I'll continue to do that. Awesome. Thanks for having right. me, everyone. Yes. Okay, and thank you to, of course, uh, Pongo Techno Valley for supporting us. Um, we got to see some of the innovative companies that are here in Pongo Techno Valley, see some of their cool products, whether it be um, related to the pharmaceutical industry or just what you put on your face to what is your keep, you know, work on my wording here, but what do you, to the keyboard that you use to type in. Um, all three products that I have a lot of interest in now, just by hearing a little bit more from them today. Um, and that's going to wrap it up. So for everyone who uh, is watching it uh, on YouTube, we do this uh, pretty often, a couple times a year, our monthly meetup. So make sure that you uh, check us out the next time uh, we were in the United States this time, my home country. So I got to enjoy a little bit about learning about the tech scene, uh, the startup scene in New York as well. Thanks to Helena. So again, thank you for that. And uh, I think if that's okay with everyone, we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. So thank you to everyone who joined us. Thank you for everyone who was out there watching, and we'll see you next time.